Welcome to another PNW Best Life live stream. I uh, was really encouraged by everyone who attended the last one. We talked about North of Falcon and looked at all the forecast slides and everything going on there. And many of you found it after the fact and watched the recorded version, uh, which is really cool. Uh, excited to connect to all of you in this new way. And today uh, we'll give we'll give people a, a few minutes to to. Uh, to find our, our live stream, hopefully, and, and get, get connected. We'll, we'll, of course, be taking questions again, but uh, today I really want to talk about our Blackmouth season that's uh, that's going really strong. A uh, <clears throat> lot to say about what's going on with our Puget Town Blackmouth, uh, and, and there's a lot of a lot of things it means for our future and kind of <clears throat> where we're uh, where we're going with this fishery and and uh, uh, ways to enhance it and look at it. Uh, there's also some urgent action to take regarding our uh, our hatcheries and the funding for our hatcheries that I just became aware of yesterday. Uh, there's a public response, and some uh, I'll, I'll show you all what what uh, you need to do. But uh, there's an email we need to send to NOAA <clears throat> to let them know we want them to continue putting money into raising hatchery fish for orca uh, survival, <clears throat> uh, as opposed to doing things like. Cutting fishing to enhance uh, pr uh, prey availability for <clears throat> for orcas. So we'll talk about that. Uh, definitely want to talk about the predator issue, which we <clears throat> I brought up last week, and I even got some comments saying like, "Oh, where show me your sources <clears throat> on uh, the predator issue." And uh, I, I posted some links in in the comment section from last week's stream, but I've <clears throat> since then I've spent a lot more time digging into it, and uh, I found the uh, the NOAA a study that was done in, I believe, 2017 and kind of poured through that. And I've got some <clears throat> some visuals to show you all regarding that. So what, we can just talk about some of the numbers <clears throat> and what's going on with these, this predator deluge in Puget Sound. Uh, <clears throat> and then we'll just talk about Westport a little bit. You know, it's been, uh, it's been open since last Saturday, March 9th, <clears throat> but the weather uh, has been pretty terrible. Uh, I guess today's March 10th, so, so March 9th was yesterday. Uh, yeah, so the weather's been pretty snotty and, uh, but, but I'm looking forward to some, some Westport opportunity. We've got all this wind and these storms that have kind of mucking up, uh, I know people who wanted to be on the water yesterday in Puget Sound for Blackmouth, but, uh, if you look at what's coming behind it, it looks like there's a window of opportunity. And so we'll look at that. Also briefly talk about some of the Southwest Washington steelhead, Cowlitz River, some stuff like that. So, all right, there's a few of you on, that's all I need. Uh, as always, uh, um, feel free to just drop your comments in the, in the chat here, any questions, uh, that you might have and, and I'll, uh, I'll interrupt and kind of <clears throat> jump into that, but we'll kind of follow that progression starting with, starting with the blackmouth uh, fishery. So, you know, this, this I, I got, this was my, uh, small ish keeper from, uh, from Thursday, I fished Wednesday and Thursday and, uh, I unfortunately lost some much larger fish than, uh, than, than, than this one. And, uh, but I saw, a, you know, I saw a legitimate 13 pound hatchery fish bonked in front of me and verified, you know, they weighed it. I know, I know the person through another person, uh, and got that validated. So it's funny. I posted this, uh, you know, this, this comment, on this video on YouTube shorts and, and people were like, Oh, there's no, you're wrong. There's no mid teens black mouth, you know, in, in Puget sound, and blah, blah, blah. There's no mid teens Chinook and during black mouth season. I'm like, no, you're, you're very wrong about that because uh, not only did, did we know that they're, they're being caught, um, but you just, you just, you, you just know the difference when you hook into a quality 10 plus pound uh, Chinook salmon compared to these, these little guys. And, uh, and yeah, so I, so between Wednesday and Thursday, I lost three of them. Uh, totally ridiculous. Uh, you know, I hate losing nice quality Chinook salmon, uh, but I did get a keeper each day and look, it's been, it's been steady fishing. 11 has been okay, but 10 has re when the weather has cooperated 10 and what's been going on in Jeff head has really been, uh, you got you guys say it's on fire. I mean, it's truly been uh, exceptional. But let me show you some of the data from the creel surveys that WDFW has been putting out there. Let's just start with 10. Take a look at this. Take a look at this. So 
Here's the, these graphs are up on uh, pnwbestlife.com under the Marine Area 10 Chinook Salmon Fishing page. And there's also Marine Area 11 Chinook Salmon Fishing page. So you can see <clears throat> these update daily. So you can see what the fleet is doing that, that WFW is creel checking. Uh, but check out these numbers. So this one right here, right? This, this was Wednesday, uh, three, six after it'd been shut down after that kind of initial opener with that bad weather. And the thing is the hotspot's been Jeff head and Jeff head is completely exposed to a South wind, which is what we had last weekend again, this weekend. And you can see, you know, yesterday three, nine, uh, much less, uh, participation for a Saturday. Uh, but look at the catch, look at the catch is still <clears throat> outstanding for less participation. So, <clears throat> you know, this, this is what's going on right now. And this blackmouth fishery is is fantastic but, but look at this day right here <clears throat> three six this is last wednesday so this is around 35 fish <clears throat> creel checked at wfw uh around 70 anglers participated that that's the the metric uh wfw likes to talk about is <clears throat> the catch per unit of effort or cpue which is a fancy way of saying um chinook uh caught divided by anglers who uh who participated <clears throat> and uh you, you basically could say <clears throat> that it's almost 0.5 it's almost 0.5 so almost uh, one chinook per every two anglers that went out <clears throat> these are these are great great numbers in fact i was i was <clears throat> talking to another gentleman i was like i was like man these are these are fantastic numbers what uh and i was just curious <clears throat> because i have all these numbers in my uh database i just went through and <clears throat> and searched them and in fact, March 6, 2024 is the sixth best CPUE, right? Uh, Chinook per angler rate in Marine Area 10 uh, since uh, 2013. So I've got 11 years of data. And since 2013, there's only been five better days total in Marine Area 10 when the angler count uh, has been above above 50 so no small sample size stuff here no like 10 anglers went out and they caught five fish <clears throat> but i'm talking big days lots of anglers on the water <clears throat> this is the sixth best day on the water in the last 11 years that's <clears throat> that's incredible <laughs> that's incredible uh <clears throat> there's been some really really solid blackmouth fishing <clears throat> in puget town let me show you uh let me show you marine area 11 Here we go. So Marine Area 11, it hasn't been as good. Marine Area 11 hasn't had a March season in a little while, but there's fish being caught. If you find the bait, you're, you're going to find the fish. If you just fish all the regular spots, troll back and forth with the fleet, when there's no nothing marking, well, it's going to be a tough, tough day. There's a lot of folks doing that. But for those who are finding the bait, they're finding the fish, and – and it's been good. It's been good. So, uh, you know, definitely if you have an opportunity, you want to get out there and take advantage of this because this is a truly, truly great black mouse season that is developing for us here. And we're only, we're only a week, a weekend. Um, I will say another dynamic here to, to, um, uh, to look at that we're always concerned about that we're always concerned about is the sublegal encounters, right? Uh, if you remember, lately we've been opening these in January, right, or, or early February, and then it gets closed down after a week because of the sublegals, right? We haven't always had the sublegal encounter quota stuff that's going on, but right now we do, and that's a different conversation uh, about uh, what that's all about. I don't want to get into that here. I just go on a rant with it. That wouldn't be very entertaining, but – we have a sublegal encounter quota, and in the past, we've been shut down because of that quota being hit. Because the reality is, when when this opens up earlier in the year, my little, my little Google map of Puget Sound, these uh, these fish are out migrating throughout Puget Sound, right? So they're they're heading north, they're going out through the through Admiralty Inlet, they're going out through the Strait, right? Well, by March, a lot of those fish, those smaller fish have have flushed out they've made their way out and so what's left are there's still going to be some subligals around but there's a lot of adults around 
um, relative to the sublingual. And so, and so you have a situation where we're catching fish, we're catching these adult salmon, and we're not hooking a lot of sublingual. Now, I don't know yet. I don't know what the test data numbers is are from WFW after after the two weekends and the weekdays, but from the little breadcrumbs that I've got, I indicate that we're not hooking a lot of sublegals. And and the numbers are way closer to one to one, one to two, than than what they have been in the past, where they've been like one to ten. Uh, I remember a day in January it was almost like one to twenty a couple of years ago. I mean, it, it, you know, we've hooked a lot of these sublegals to get to adults, and that's not happening right now. And that's great because that means that the season has a chance combined with you know crappy weather the last two weekends the season has a chance to go much further into march particularly as there's a lot of other things you can do right now you've got uh which we're going to talk about we're going to about west coast and uh, or westport and bottom fishing we're going to talk about uh steelhead in southwest washington but th there's just there's a lot going on that that the anglers can do right now you're not in january it's pretty much the only game in town right so uh, I'm hopeful, very hopeful that the season's going to continue going and it's good fishing. Uh, it's not crappy fishing. So, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's days in the summer, uh, on Marine area, uh, you know, 11 that look like this. There's days in the summer that don't even look close to what March 6th look like for a Marine area 10. So, um, if you have a chance, you got a boat that, you know, get it out of storage, get it tuned up, get the trailer all working, you want to get out there and take advantage of this while it's going. Uh, a lot of folks will be asking, well, where exactly are all these fish being hooked? Well, it's pretty public knowledge in Marine Area 10 that Jeff Head has been really solid. Jeff Head, the south side of Jeff Head, et cetera. Um, in terms of what people are using, I can just tell you what, what's been in my network, what's been a really hot, hot lure. And, of course, for me, I like to, I like to spin anchovies in a helmet. That's like my go-to. I'm a believer in that. But I have not been getting bit on the anchovy in the helmet nearly uh, the extent as this this guy right here has been producing. This is a 3.5 uh, cookies and cream spoon. And, uh, you know, some other people have been using a 4.0. I know the 3.0 has been working too. But I've been using the 3.5. And it's, it's, it's outfishing uh, all the other um, offerings that I put down or other people in the boat with me have put down. Um, or some of the folks in my network. So, you know, give that give that a shot, and uh, and, and hopefully you can. You know, in terms of flasher, I've been using blue and purple, but most of my bites have been on a blue flasher uh, this year. So you, you just never know. But but you know, you go with that blue crush flasher that I talk about a lot on my on my website, my other other videos, and that cookies and cream spoon. You're going to hook some chinook. Uh, you know, they, a lot of a lot of it's been in 120, 130 feet of water. Uh, you know, look for bait, look, you're fishing five feet from the bottom, right? You drop down, let that downrigger actually hit bottom, bring it up a few feet, try to stay on the depth line. You know, I, I have a, um, uh, an, a, a Garmin autopilot, which really helps with that, helps me nail that depth line. It's really hard to fish if you're, if you're person driving the boat is going up and down the slope because you can go from 110 to 150 really fast if you're trying to operate a downrigger. Uh, that can be really challenging. So uh, a lot of videos on my uh, channel about how to do this, this different stuff, blackmouth videos, downrigger fishing for salmon videos out there. Uh, so, so give it, give it a, give it a try. Feel free to drop me a comment or question. If you have any questions about technique here, um, I'm assuming a lot of this stuff is pretty easy, pretty knowledgeable stuff. And, um, but if, if you don't know how, just definitely uh, reach out, ask, cause um, I'm always, I, I, I don't really ignore anyone that, that asks me for help on this stuff. So, um, yeah, well, okay, all right. So let's see here. So that's, so we covered the, uh, kind of how the black mouth seasons going. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So all right, let me just talk a little bit more about this out migration thing. So the idea that, uh, the recreational angler community had, and those that are really plugged in the process was like, Hey, you know, we've got all, these small Chinook flushing out of Puget Sound in January and February. Let's delay the opening into March, and then hopefully can go through through April. And so far, that is playing out in our favor in a really, really strong way. Um, I personally have had some some questions about is blackmail fishing in Puget Sound still viable? 
what is this a is this a long term thing, right? Or should we try to move our impacts some to some other month of the year? Uh, you know, and and once you move them, you're probably not getting them back, right? So, uh, you know, that's been that's been a conversation that uh, that various folks have had. And one of the reasons why we've been having that is because of this graph here, um, which is the this is the number of delayed release Chinook in Puget Sound. So what am I talking about? We're delayed release Chinook. So uh, when you keep Chinook in the hatchery longer, right? You don't release them as fingerlings. You you let them grow to, to, to you know, closer to a yearling size. They tend to stay, they tend to residualize in Puget Sound. Now, you know, Chinook are, uh, there's no rule here with, with, with their uh, necessarily what they're doing because uh, you know, Chinook could go, they could go out to the Strait, <clears throat> they could go west and go up the west coast of Vancouver Island to southeast Alaska, <clears throat> they could hang out in the San Juans, they could go up to the Strait of Georgia, <clears throat> right, they can go, and then they can come back. There's no rules like, like, oh, there's, these Chinook stay in Puget Sound, these ones <clears throat> migrate up, right, they're, they're going to fall, they're following the feed around, right, <clears throat> so they're going to be wherever the feed is, but the, uh, the, what uh so i'm a part of this group i'm part of this this advisory group called psr fefoc it's the puget sound wreckfish enhancement fund oversight committee and this was established by the legislature uh to oversee a bucket of, of funds uh, and give recommendations about it that was was meant to be spent on enhancing the recreational fishing opportunity outside of the summer season so you know, Puget Town's a long history of summer Chinook fishing <clears throat> being fantastic and looking at how can we extend this out beyond like this sort of peak months of like, you know, June, July into September, et cetera, with Chinook, Coho, all that. So we got this fund and a lot of the money in this fund gets spent on raising yearling Chinook, right? Uh, but something, and this was around 99, 2000, I believe, uh, and so I, I joined the committee two years ago and, uh, you know, I'm involved in these discussions about what to do with these funds. But what 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 some of the things that come out is in the history of this is that the survival rate of these yearling Chinook had plummeted from the late 90s to uh, to 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 recent history. So uh, we're spending a lot of money. It takes a lot more money to keep the Chinook longer at the hatchery to get to a yearling. Right. Uh, you got to deal with potential disease. you got to deal with <laughs> uh, feeding them the entire time. Like it's more money to keep these Chinook around. But when you release them, they're more likely to stay around the Puget Town and get caught during the, the winter black mouth season. That's kind of the that's kind of the idea. Right. Well, when the survival rate of these things plummeted uh, and so you, you're releasing a lot of smolts and, and they're not coming back as adults and they're not getting caught in the winter fishery, there's a lot of what's going on. Right. And if you've been following uh, following along here, you know that a similar phenomenon has been happening with uh, with with our steelhead, Puget Sound steelhead, uh, with, you know, hatchery survival rates have have plummeted in the last 20 years. And so we've shifted some of that money from yearling Chinook to the, the fingerling Chinook. Right. Now let me pull up another, another graph for you. And part of that is just even though we can raise more of the fingerlings, more of them die off, right? It's a, uh, but you, it's cheaper. And so it's, it's cheaper to get uh, a higher number of adults back uh, available for orcas, available for fisheries and uh, making it back to the hatchery. So let me just show you, uh, this is a graph of Chinook released in Puget Sound by WFW. So you could see, and this number I believe was even higher before 2008. So the, the orange is the yearling Chinook releases, right? And it's just been, we had a little brief little period of little bumps, but it's just been squeezed. It's been squeezed out. It's harder to, you kind of got to squint to see it on this graph, but it's getting smaller and smaller as uh, it's just not been very viable. I think I did some math that calculated um, to, to produce one black mouth keeper uh, during the the black mouth season, uh, these we would spend around two thousand dollars per keeper um, in raising it, and all all the die off that will happen, the predation, and and what it would take to get that keeper into um, 
into on, on an angler's boat being retained, right? So uh, that, those are good numbers. Those are the, and the numbers on fingerlings are much better. So uh, there there is some debate about what what are we doing with this pro, these programs? What are we doing with this season? Especially given the fact that they haven't been very good in the last few years, right? They've been they've been closed very quickly because of the sublegal encounters, things like that. So I've had a lot of questions myself. Well, what are we doing? Where are we going with this whole uh, blackmouth fishery? Now let me show you another graph. This is all sources Chinook, at least in Puget Town. I want you to think about this number. Think about this number. So uh, this is 2022. There was right around 50 million. 50 million. Okay. Keep keep, the, keep this number in your head. 50 million uh, Chinook released in Puget Sound, all, all sources, okay? Uh, now, I, I started digging through the NOAA study, as I said at the beginning of the stream, um, looking at the, what, you know, the, the marine predation issue that, that NOAA published a lot of data on, a lot of findings on back in 2017, uh, somewhat controversial, although a lot of us uh, recreational anglers, we already knew many of these things. A lot of our uh, our, our our salmon were ending up as um, seal, sea lion poo, and uh, not not enhancing the fisheries the way that the way that you would expect. And so here's one of the graphs from their uh, hold on a second from their presentation or their paper, um, and I'll link it in the uh, description of when this goes um, goes onto YouTube. So you can read it for yourself. <clears throat> this is the stacked graph of all the smolt releases up to 2015. <clears throat> and I, I, you know, you basically can look at this and go, oh, Puget Sound's released or the Salish Sea in total. That's this one here. It's like army green kind of color. Is around 70 million smolts. Okay, 70 million smolts. So Puget Sound, 50 million, another 20 million. Uh, to, to comprise all the sailor seats. Keep that number in your mind. 50 million, Puget Town, 70 million sailor sea. Now I want to show you, I want to show you another graph that's going to blow your mind. This is the number of salmon estimated by NOAA that are consumed by harbor seals. Okay. Uh, this is only, this ends at 2015, but you see that the graph is going up into the right. So what is this now? Uh, this is probably much higher, right? It's probably it's probably out here, uh, but you're talking conservatively over 30 million salmon consumed by harbor seals. And, and it's funny because you know when uh, when we're out there fishing, yeah, sometimes a seal will take our, our salmon, but oftentimes it's a it's a big old sea lion or something like that, and it's very visible, or you see sea lions out there eating salmon, well, harbor seals primarily consume smolt. The biomass, the tonnage of what they consume is actually is actually pretty small compared to sea lions, killer whales, um, et cetera. But the numbers are, are off the charts. And uh, I was looking at another paper that showed that from, the, from, uh, from tagging these critters, they see that most of the consumption is happening in the evening and the nighttime. So you're not, you're not seeing what's going on. You're not seeing what's actually happening. But, this, but we know uh, from these scientific studies that 30 million plus uh, salmon in the Salish Sea are being consumed by harbor seals. Now, remember, that's almost, that's almost equal to the total amount of smolts that, that WFW is producing in hatcheries. Which was around 50 million, right? Um, that's an insane number. That's an insane number that are being consumed by harbor seals. Uh, I just sat through the North of Falcon meeting, uh, the kickoff forecast, and we talk about the environment, the marine survival. We talk about hatchery production. We talk about all these things. We, we don't. We don't bring up. We don't bring up predation. It's not even mentioned one time. I tried to ask a question about it, but the, the sound audio was kind of garbled. And apparently they didn't get it, but um, I'm going to go in person on uh, on Wednesday to Olympia, and if there's another opportunity to bring it up, but but, but why aren't why aren't we talking more about this? Thirty million consumed by harbor seals. Now, in WFW's uh, defense, they did a very very nice presentation on the topic last year north of Falcon, and they talked about the different options with the Marine Mammal Protection Act, things that they're trying to do outside of lethal removal, uh, but 
and I don't have all the answers here, but man, we need answers to this. And and I have I'm I've always started to dig into the avian predation, which is also significant. That's before the harbor seals even get to take their chunk. And and so what we're seeing is if any of our salmon or steelhead spend a lot of time in Puget Sound, they don't stand a very good chance of surviving. Uh, that's probably what's happening with our Puget Sound steelhead, hatchery fish, wild fish, whatever. That's what's happening with our, our why, even though we've jacked up our hatchery production, where's it going? We've restored habitat for, for wild fish in many ways. We have much more work to do there. But but where's it all going? Well, it's it's becoming uh, seal poo is the bottom line of where it's going. And so we, we have we have some work to do. I don't know what all the answers are, but I'm going to continue to uh, to drive this, and I and I know others are as well. We want to make sure that there there is going there are going to be answers at some point to this because this is just not sustainable, right? We have an ecosystem that's way out of balance. Uh, there's another graph I didn't I didn't pull up here, but the the, the population in this period of, of harbor seals has grown by 10x um, from 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 where it was and in, in, where this graph starts in 1975. So. So, so yeah, we, we have an ecosystem that's out of balance. We have challenges here just as stewards of the resources. Um, the way, there, there's work that, that needs to be done here. Um, so yeah, let's let's talk about, uh, let's talk for a second about this NOAA uh, request, okay? So I got this email from Puget Sound Anglers that uh, there's, and I'm, I've got the article up here, a uh, study revealing that hatcheries yield more salmon for endangered killer whales and new analysis open for comment. So uh, just so you know, uh, the draft environmental impact response to a 2022 court order, which found deficiencies in NOAA Fisheries 2019 analysis of domestic actions connected to Pacific Salmon Treaty Agreement. Translation, uh, the wild fish folks sued, uh, sued these different organizations to get them to stop raising uh, hatchery fish, and and so now they're having to reopen it and re-examine it. And they came up with four options for federal funding that they're taking public comment on right now. Uh, number one is you just discontinue federal funding to increase uh, orca uh, killer whale prey. Number two, you keep producing hatchery salmon <laughs> to increase killer whale prey. Uh, this is the preferred alternative. It's what we've been doing since 2020. Uh, Habitat-based prey increase, redirecting funding from hatchery production, that's cut hatchery production, to habitat restoration that would increase the abundance of salmon produced in the wild by improving habitat. We've already tried that for the last 15 years. And by the way, we have a lot more work to do. We should, we should not stop doing that work. But in the meantime, uh, we definitely need to continue to uh, put money into, into, into raising more fish for hatcheries. But number four, truly an awful option being proposed here reduce fishing, redirecting funding from hatchery production to reduce shook salmon fishery to leave more salmon prey available for killer whales. Well, I have another graph for you. This is the also from the NOAA study. This is in the Salish Sea. This black line is fisheries, biomass consumed fisheries. And over here are, uh, this is wild uh, salmon, natural origin salmon. This is hatchery origin salmon. Consumed, total consumed by predators okay so what do you see here since 1980 the amount consumed by fisheries steadily decreased right we're at almost 20 less than 20 percent of what it used to be and then you see the the wild hatchery uh origin consumption of salmon the total consumption of salmon has increased right so as we have cut fisheries uh, the marine mammal predators have stepped up their game and taken our place to, um, and, and, and so there's not been a net benefit for availability of salmon, uh, for orcas, uh, or, uh, just for avoiding extinction. So you have we, the idea of cutting fisheries. It's already been tried. It's been, it's what we've been dealing with for the last 40 years. We've been cutting fisheries in the Salish Sea and salmon are not bouncing back. So uh, we have more work to do here. We, we can't keep trying the same thing and failing at it. Um, so there you go. 
that's uh, all I, I think all I want to say about that uh, for the time being. But but please, th this comment, public comment period uh, expires uh, midday on Monday. And so uh, you need to, if you care about this, uh, here's here's what you need to do. Uh, you can contact the project manager, this phone number, or very easy, drop an email, hatcheries.public.comment at noaa.gov and let them know. Option number two is what you prefer. No option four. We've got to do something. Option number two is where we want to be. So uh, comments close tomorrow, tomorrow, uh, Monday, March 11th, I believe around noon. Uh, you know, a lot of times we don't, we don't have an opportunity to take any kind of action. We jump on social media and, and there's a lot of complaining and whining about all this stuff. Well, here's something you can do. Uh, if you care about these things, if you, if you like catching, <laughs> catching salmon and you don't want to see these orcas uh, go extinct and their numbers dip below a line that they won't allow them to bounce back, then you can get on this, take action and, um, and drop, write an email. It takes 30 seconds um, to, to sound off on this. Cause you can bet, you can bet, the folks who want to cut all the hatchery production, uh, their stuff's already been tried as far as I'm concerned. They're, they're, their solutions have, have been in the works for the last 10, 15 years, and it's yielded us nothing. It's why we're in this scenario with the orcas not having prey in the first place. Um, but you can bet that they're going to be uh, very loud about this topic. Um, but there's a lot more of us who want to see this done the right way than there are them. But you got to get involved. you got to be active. you got to get your voice out there. So... Uh, all right, that is it for this topic. Real quick, I want to show you something. Um, if you're new to kind of following me here, uh, I, I'm passionate about the outdoors, uh, as you can see. Uh, but I also I came from a, a technology background and IT background, so I I, uh, I like to build digital tools that help me uh, actually, uh, and, and all of you who are willing to. I jump on board with this kind of process of how I go about finding the best opportunities and planning fishing trips. Um, we, we only have so much time, you know, we're, you know, working uh, nine to five jobs, working odd schedules. We only have so much time to, to fish. And so, you know, my goal with building these digital tools, help all of us uh, spend less time uh, preparing and, and researching uh, to be able to do these things and be uh, effective. So, I've got a new I've got a new feature that right now is just on the Marine Area 11 Chinook salmon fishing page here, um, but it's an integrated uh, tide and marine forecast feature for uh, I'm, I'm going to put it on all of my marine uh, area pages. So I'll have it for Westport, I'll have it for all the Puget Sound marine areas, uh, the ocean marine areas, all that. So uh, you can also uh, also, you should check out if you're at all nervous about marine weather safety, which which is something we should all be concerned about. I've got a very comprehensive guide to that topic here that will be linked on every one of these pages. You can always go to the uh, NWS Marine Forecast page to verify because this is still kind of I'm kind of testing these features out and uh, the automation is still working some bugs out, but it's, it's been pretty solid. So um, it shows you. Uh, an integrated view of the marine forecast. You can see this was today, Sunday, March 10th. You you know, this was in, this is the Puget Sound Hood Canal marine forecast from NOAA. And then you also have the tides right in a table right below. So you, you don't have to go to two different sources to get this information. So you have the predicted high tide, low tide, the delta, which is very important because the delta tells us how much water is moving. You see the average feet per hour. These are pretty big tide swings, right? Uh, almost a 14-foot delta from the previous low last night to the high tide at 6.02 a.m. this morning, uh, moving an average of 1.8 feet per hour. That's a that's a screaming current for Puget Sound. Uh, anything anything above 1.5 is a pretty pretty strong current. And why that's important is it changes how you think about fishing that day, right? Higher current. Uh, you're going to have more bait pinned up against uh, steep ledges uh, and, and fish congregated to feed there. And tide changes in these scenarios can be really, really great fishing versus you get some really soft tides. It doesn't move a lot of bait around. And, and you, you might think differently about how to approach that that day of fishing. So um, check it out. 
uh, give me your feedback. If there's a different format or something that would make it more readable for you, um, easier to comprehend, um, let me know. Definitely take feedback and all this. Again, this is about making all of our lives easier as we're trying to plan fishing trips um, and uh, and be successful out there on the water. So so that's a, that's one new feature I'm rolling out. And then um, let's see. Oh, yeah, I wanted to talk about Westport. So. So Westport opened yesterday, uh, March 9th, for all the bottom fishing stuff, the link cod, the rockfish, right? <laughs> so I grabbed this screenshot from the NOAA forecast, uh, which I don't have yet on my Marine Area 2 page. Um, if you're wondering, coastal waters from Point Grenville to Cape Shoal Water, out 10 nautical miles. This is basically, basically your area that you're looking at for Westport bottom fishing. Um, you know, we've got some really nasty conditions right now, uh, but, but the, you're going to see these things change as we get into the middle and later part of, of next week. Right. So you can already see by Thursday, the swell gets down to six feet, um, from, you know, what it is right now, which is, you know, 12 to 15, 15 feet seas, which is nasty. No one wants to be out in that, uh, so you got all these hazardous weather alerts up here <clears throat> you want to avoid all that uh so i i'm i'm eager to see the friday and the saturday <clears throat> forecast appear on here um because uh th these could be great opportunities it could be low swell great opportunities to get out across the bar and do some bottom fishing now the other thing you got to look at is the tides though and one thing about crossing the bar is you generally don't want to cross the bar during max ebb, right? In the middle between between a high and a low tide, the middle point of that is often gonna be your max ebb. So if you're looking at like, let's say, uh, let's say Friday, you have a high at 4.53 a.m. because we had spring forward, right? We have sunrise at 7.28, a low 11.34 a.m. Well, you can't really, if you're trying to get out in the morning before an afternoon breeze kicks up or you got other stuff to do in the afternoon and evening, it's going to be challenging to get out and avoid the ebb. Uh, so that's something to consider on these days that let's say you know, there's a bunch of crab pots out there, right? So I don't want to, you don't want to run in the dark and uh, you know, tangle your motor on the bar because you ran over a commercial crab pot that are all littered all over the place. So uh, please don't run out in the dark unless you have some way of, of avoiding that. But I'm, I'm not, I'm not about to do that. So, you know, I'm looking at these tides going, okay, if I launch at 7, first light, by the time I get to the bar at 7.15, I can probably navigate really well. 7.15, it's two hours into the ebb. That ebb might be, might, the peak of this is probably around 8 a.m. So I'm, I'm not quite at peak, but I'm kind of close to peak, uh, peak ebb. And, uh if you're confused about this concept, please go read my Marine Weather Safety page about why this is why peak ebb is something you want to avoid. Now, I've been out over the bar on a on a max ebb when the swell is really low. So, if, let's say we get you know a swell of three feet over 12 seconds. I'm probably that's that's like probably a full send for me, and uh, and I'm going uh, with my boat and in my confidence level for 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 handling that. Um, everyone's a little different on that, so you know you gotta you gotta figure that out, but. Uh, yeah, so, so that's something I'm looking at because I really want to get out again. I want to take advantage of these, these early spring, uh, bottom fishing opportunities with the greatest abundance of quality lings on all the rock piles before all the charters come in and <laughs> pick them off. So, um, yeah, I'm looking at some of these windows, uh, Saturday would be better. Sunday would be, would be really good, right? Because, uh, you would be able to get across the bar right around high tide. That would be a opportune time if if the weather holds up so uh gonna be watching these forecasts really closely and getting excited to see you know if you look at the long-term forecast just in your weather app you see sun 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 i think 70 degrees and sunny uh i mean it could be if if that also comes with really uh soft marine weather conditions light winds like it's game on it is game on for westport bottom fishing so <clears throat> We'll keep an eye on that. Last thing, we're about to wrap up here. Uh, I don't have any questions, and I have something to do here in a few minutes. So um, we'll wrap up here. But I did want to bring up the steelhead topic a little bit. So this is on my Calus River fishing page. 
pnwbestlife.com. You can find it there. Uh, this updates every Thursday afternoon. And you can see our uh, steelhead escapement numbers are growing steadily. Now, where are we in the run? Where are we in the run? So, again, this graph is out there too. Uh, and you can see we are, let's see, we're about here, mid-March, right? So most of the time these runs are peaking in right at the end of March, early April. And so we're in this kind of like shoulder bump. But even that, look at this, this, this shoulder is around 500 fish in a week. We're still kind of down here in the middle. So we've got some work to do. There's, there's potentially a lot more steelhead coming in uh, on this cow if this run is at all respectable. Um, you can expect that it's going to get a lot better than what it's been. And it's been pretty good already with uh, as long as you can avoid the smelt. Uh, and those should largely be done. Hopefully, um, you know, there's there's opportunities here to, to get it done um, on the Cowlitz. And so I'll be taking advantage of that as well. Hopefully I have success to share with you all there. But that's that's all I've got for now. Uh, hope to see you all in the water. Feel free to reach out, drop me a comment, drop me an email, follow me on Instagram or Twitter, or wherever you find to connect with me, drop me an email. Please uh, drop that email to Noah um, about the, 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 the hatchery production. And, and, and that's really something you got to jump on now. So um, stay safe out there. Uh, and uh, yeah, hope to see, hope to see you all on the water. Love it when people come up and say hi and, and uh, get to know different people in the fishing community. So uh, hopefully this was helpful to you. And if I get more positive response, I'll keep doing these live streams and keep uh, uh, answering questions. And I, and I got to get a better scheduling system so you all know uh, ahead of time that it's coming. But uh, yeah, um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see you out there uh, <clears throat> and uh, take care.